Welcome to Mutual of Omaha's Wild Kingdom. In recent years, women have been entering conservation work in growing numbers. Our special report today is on women in the wild kingdom, and we have selected two of them who typify the work women are doing in modern conservation. They are both university doctoral candidates, and their research projects include studies of the cougar or mountain lion of the Rocky Mountains in Colorado, and the American alligator in southern Georgia's vast Okefenokee Swamp. For the first part of our special report, we'll go to the mountains of southern Colorado, here in the wild country near Canyon City. That's where the important research on mountain lions is occurring, up in this high tree-studded country. Because of the rugged terrain, using experienced lion tracking hounds becomes necessary for this young wildlife biologist working toward her doctorate at Colorado State University, Mary Jean Currier. Mountain lion are fairly abundant in the West, but it's difficult to estimate just how many of them there are. That's one thing we're trying to do on our study area. Since the mountain lion is a big game animal in Colorado, it's important that we know that the population is at an optimum level or if it's being over-harvested. To determine that, we need to know its age structure. The first step in answering both of these questions is to find and immobilize a mountain lion, and that's no easy job. Helping Mary Jean is veteran guide and outfitter Chuck Anderson of Castle Rock. He knows that mountain lions often cross these ridge tops and he's able to put his hounds on the trail of one immediately. The dog named Pup discovers it first and is followed at once by the others. The trail is old, but Mary Jean knows that the dogs may jump the mountain lion up ahead if it holed up in these high rocks. From on top, she and Chuck will be able to clearly hear the trailing hounds, and maybe they will even see their quarry. Today, they're fortunate. Chuck spots a male cougar who was hidden in the rocks here. Still on the cold trail, the dogs are not excited yet, but their baying has definitely unnerved the mountain lion. Now that the direction the hounds are taking has been determined, Mary Jean and Chuck will continue to follow. Mountain lions ordinarily tree when chased by hounds, though usually not so soon as this one did. When the dogs find the cat up this ponderosa pine, their voices change, indicating the cat has treed. Fearful of the hounds, the mountain lion would remain in the tree many hours if humans were not nearby to intervene. Mary Jean and Chuck are very pleased at the shortness of this chase, since sometimes pursuit will last for many miles. Mary Jean has gone through this same experience many times before. She'll wait until Chuck has tied the dogs a short distance away from here before darting the mountain lion. With the dogs under control, 
The scientific work now begins for Mary Jean. I'll be using a dart which contains about two cc's of the immobilizing agent, which will be injected into the cat on impact. It is fencyclidine hydrochloride, which has a wide safety margin and does not affect the heart or breathing. The drug is one of several we use in this work. The dart is propelled from this capture gun. Most often when it strikes, the mountain lion will immediately leap from the tree and run until it collapses. I always aim for a well-muscled part of the cat, such as the hip. It's a good hit and should take effect fairly quickly. Something rather uncommon is happening this time. The cat's not leaving the tree. That's not good. He could get hurt if he fell down on a rock, so we'll have to try to prevent this. We only have a little time left in which to do something before he drops off that branch. And there's only one thing we can do now. Chuck is going to try to direct the fall of the cat into a dense bush at the base of the tree. He's unhurt, but losing muscle control. By the time I get there, he will be unable to move very much. The fact that the cat did not run off when darted has unexpectedly saved us considerable effort. All we have to do now is carry him to a more level area where the important data collecting can begin. Since the length of time the mountain lion will remain under the influence of the immobilizing drug is limited, Mary Jean Courier, with Chuck Anderson's help, immediately sets about taking a blood sample. This drawing of the blood is one of the more important procedures. From analysis of the blood, we can learn if the animal is diseased. Further, my research indicates that serum analysis may be of value in determining the animal's age. While Chuck prepares the rigging on which we'll later hoist the mountain lion to weigh it, I'll continue with my work here. This is a non-toxic paint. It is used to take a pad print from a hind foot to establish the correlation between the actual size of the track and the print we make. Possibly, this might later allow us to determine from tracks the size of any mountain lion. Another important procedure is checking the animal's gum line. This might be a good index to the mountain lion's age, since there is a measurable receding of the gum line as the animal grows older. I use a dental probe calibrated in millimeters for the measurement. To every cat we capture, we attach a red nylon collar, which has a plastic identification number. If the same cat is treed later, he can be immediately identified. He's regaining a little muscle control, but there's still plenty of time to finish our measurements. Since Chuck has the rigging ready to weigh the cat, I'll get the sling attached. As soon as Mary Jean and Chuck complete their weighing of this mountain lion, tattoo its ears with the same number as that which is on its collar, 
and finish recording some other body measurements, the work on this cat will be completed. The cat will then be taken to a shady place and allowed to regain control of itself as the effects of the drug wears off. During that time, they will observe it from a distance to make certain the recovery is complete and the lion is reacting normally again. The three-year study has thus far shown that the population level of mountain lions is one every 12 to 22 square miles. We are also learning that both lion and human populations can coexist with a minimum of friction if appropriate management techniques are observed. While the mountain lion research continues in Colorado, our special report on women in the wild kingdom now moves halfway across the continent to southern Georgia, here in the Okefenokee National Wildlife Refuge. That's where a study of the American alligator is underway. This is part of the 640 square mile marsh called Okefenokee, an area of tangled trees, deep bogs, and these areas called wet prairies. This is where we join another scientist, Myrna Watanabe, who is presently utilizing this vast swamp as her laboratory as she works toward her doctorate in biology at New York University. For the past two years, I've been studying the behavior of the alligator in this relatively undisturbed habitat. Man is the adult alligator's only natural enemy. As man and alligator are increasingly coming into contact with one another, it's important that we study the alligator to learn how both species may peacefully coexist. Much of Myrna Watanabe's research deals with communication among alligators. She's attempting to interpret the communication system between mother and young. That bellow might be a courtship vocalization, but Myrna's research verifies it may also be given to signify location and identity. Myrna is studying the response of the adult alligators to any young gator distress calls. These are broadcast first through this speaker high on shore, and then this one in a grassy area. She is now activating the first speaker. This female, which I've often observed, is nine feet long and about 200 pounds. She immediately heads in the direction of the speaker situated between the trees. I assume she's trying to locate the young distressed alligator in order to give whatever protection it needs. She has determined that the sound is coming from here. Mother alligators often gently mouth their grunting young and perhaps this is what she's attempting to do here. But when she mouths the speaker and disconnects it, stopping the distress cries, she rapidly loses interest. With that test concluded, I can begin another on the second speaker. It's incredible how swiftly the sounds trigger a response. Another female alligator, about eight feet long, is already moving in to investigate. She is trying to locate the young alligator she hears calling. Individual alligators react differently to the distress cries. This one finds no youngster in jeopardy here. And so, after briefly mouthing the speaker, even though it continues broadcasting cries, she retreats. The work of studying the vocal communication among alligators is one of the daytime phases of Myrna Watanabe's research. A nighttime phase will occur in a few hours. To accurately describe alligators and their behavior, Myrna Watanabe must determine their sex and size. To do this, it is necessary to capture and tag the alligators. This is best done at night, when the alligators may be approached and captured 
with greater facility and safety. That's what Myrna is going to do now. As twilight deepens over the Suwannee Canal, Myrna is far out in the swamp again. This time, she's accompanied by Wendell Metzen, chief biologist of Okefenokee National Wildlife Refuge. They'll try to catch an alligator using a pole having a wire cable noose, which will be slipped over the animal's head. Myrna's bright headlamp is an aircraft landing light powered by a car battery. An alligator caught in the light's intense beam will freeze in place, allowing the scientists to approach closely. A bright red-orange glow reflects from the alligator's eyes at night. This makes it easy to find them. Once the noose is placed and tightened, the fight is on. A frightened alligator is very dangerous. At least two people are needed just to hold an animal this size. It's imperative to get those dangerous jaws under control. They must be drawn shut with a cord looped over the snout while the animal is momentarily quiet. However, placing that loop properly can be rather difficult. Even when it appears to be in place, if the loop is not swiftly tightened, the alligator will twist free of it. This time, we succeed. As it tires, the alligator is becoming quiescent. Nevertheless, we can't assume that one loop on the snout is enough. Alligators have enormous and powerful muscles for closing their jaws, but very little strength to open them against any pressure once closed. For the first time since the action began, the alligator is reasonably under control. It's not much over 100 pounds and shouldn't be too difficult for us to pull into the boat. Although the specimen is now placid, alligators have sharp claws on all four feet and they can do much damage with the slap of the tail. So Wendell must be very careful. Now, with this alligator under complete control, we can prepare to affix the type of tags we put on all the alligators we capture. The tagging operation is important for identification of specific animals. The tags are numbered and color-coded as to sex and size class. Tags used for mature females like this are yellow. These data are logged carefully for future reference. A hole is punched in an upright scale, or skewed, at the base of the tail. Here, a tag is attached, which is easily visible from a distance, as the animal floats on the surface or basks out of the water. As insurance, a numbered metal tag is clamped on in case the colored tag is lost. The age of a juvenile alligator can be estimated fairly accurately by its length. In the Okefenokee, alligators grow about a foot per year for the first five years. Determining the age of an adult alligator like this, however, becomes extremely difficult.
This one measures seven and a half feet. The largest alligator we've caught in the Okefenokee was just over 11 feet and weighed 300 pounds. But we have seen larger ones here. Our final marking of this animal is with highly visible, non-toxic paint on the snout, which lasts several weeks and provides immediate identification. With the work on this specimen completed, Myrna Watanabe and Wendell Metzen can now release it, but even that effort involves considerable risk. The alligator has been quiet for some time now and has regained some of its strength. The researchers don't take chances, so they won't relinquish control of the animal until it is safely out of the boat. One can't afford even a moment of carelessness where alligators are concerned. With the loosening of the noose, the alligator is once again free. I hope that my study of alligators during their reproductive cycle will give us a clearer understanding of the life history of these remarkable animals and will aid us in ensuring their continued survival. By understanding their behavior, we learn to respect them. As a former teacher, I think that's a very important lesson for us and for our children. The work being done by young scientists in all phases of wildlife research and conservation is of great importance. The future of conservation is in the hands of these young people, many of whom are performing advanced research work in the field as well as in the laboratory. Myrna Watanabe with her alligator research in Georgia and Mary Jean Currier with her continuing research on mountain lions in Colorado exemplify the dedication these scientists bring to their work. They and others like them are making wildlife their strong concern. And in doing so, they are helping to ensure there will always be a rich and varied wild kingdom.